Jason, it is my really great pleasure to introduce to you Nate and Raymond, uh, and uh, it's also great to see you again, Nathan. I've met Nathan last semester in a dinner, and he quoted JC, uh, Encore, do you want more? So uh, today he will have uh, his Encore here with us uh, at the Yale Global Justice Program. Um, uh, Nathan Raymond is a human rights investigator. He's specializing on investigation of war crimes, uh, uh, among others, mass killings and tortures. Um, he has directed the anti-torture campaign at uh, Physicians for Human Rights and uses, uh, for example, satellite surveillance and sur uh, satellite technology to investigate those war crimes. He's uh, also a affiliate of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiatives, and he advocates the use of intelligence by human rights groups and other non-governmental no organizations. Uh, and uh, Yale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And he's a lecturer at Yale Public School, uh, Yale, Yale School of Public Health. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for being here and uh, sharing your uh, work and ideas. Fantastic, and it's been great to be here today and hear all the other presenters. Um, I've learned a lot. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been on Zoom since 7 a.m., so the voice is cutting out. Um, but the, uh, the presentation that I'm going to give today is really about uh, work that we're doing here at Yale School of Public Health Humanitarian Research Lab, where I'm executive director uh, on behalf of the U.S. Department of State, um, a program called the Conflict Observatory, where we are using satellite, uh, commercial satellite imagery data and open source information uh, to document uh, for purposes of future accountability, uh, alleged crimes by uh, uh, Russia and aligned forces in Ukraine. But I'm going to try to um, center this presentation or preface it within uh, a brief history of how uh, technology has uh, changed the way in which uh, accountability, primarily in an international context, but also in US domestic context as well, happens. And to, to talk about basically the way in which um, artificial intelligence and digital data is changing war itself. And so to, um, and we'll see some examples in a little bit of the work that we're doing here at Yale as part of the accountability efforts uh, in Ukraine. But to begin, um, going back not that far, um, approximately about, I would say at most 15 years in the early 21st century, there was primarily three ways that you learned um, about alleged uh, mass atrocities in a war zone. Uh, one is you um, uh, had researchers interviewing people as they crossed out of a non-permissive environment. A good example of this is uh, at the start of the 21st century, uh, much of what we learned about what was happening in Chechnya came from uh, researchers collecting testimony, but also uh, doing quantitative and qualitative surveys of uh, IDPs, internally displaced people, moving across the border from Chechnya to Ingushetia and uh, Dagestan, neighboring states to Chechnya. Uh, the second way you learned about uh, what was happening is often through humanitarian aid workers or UN agencies that were able to gain limited access or some form of access um, to the area where the fighting was happening and would send, in the case of Rwanda, famously, uh, most of that communication was done by fax. And so, uh, you know, in 1994, much of what we initially learned uh, about Rwanda was transmitted through fax machines. Um, Philip Gorevich's famous book, um, We Wish to Inform You, um, and I'll probably be butchering the title, uh, that tomorrow um, uh, we and our families will be killed. Um, that line, that's the title of the book, came from a fax 
that was sent out of Rwanda, people who knew they were going to die, um, notifying people in the West that um, they were to be killed in the morning. And so uh, we have um, either civilians uh, on the ground or uh, aid workers or intergovernmental organizations or journalists providing some form of testimony of the experience, um, often through phone and through fax. Uh, the third way uh, we learned what was going on um, was retrospectively and mostly through um, what's called, and, and I'm using a very uh, wonky term here, but medico legal forensics. So medico, M E D I C O, not medical, medico legal forensics, um, what's often uh, called. Uh, mass grave forensic anthropology. So through remains um, of a deceased individual um, or through a physical examination of those who survived abuses in the past, we would collect this forensic evidence and much of what you saw in the international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, um, which preceded the International Criminal Court being established in 1998 by the Rome Statute, much of the evidence that was used in those uh, tribunals came from uh, basically forensic examination of survivors in the dead. And uh, the technology that was used in those cases was primarily uh, DNA. And so DNA analysis um, played a really critical role in the Srebrenica um, trial of uh, uh, generals in the former Yugoslavia, Serbs who were involved in the um, disappearance and killing of thousands of young men and boys. And so um, there was, and this is sort of the pivot here, in the case of Srebrenica, there was a unique type of data that was involved. Um, and that data was, uh, uh, reconnaissance uh, photography that was taken by the U.S. Air Force and the CIA uh, through the use of an SR-71 Blackbird. Um, it was a reconnaissance spy plane that was flying overhead at the moment that the uh, Severnitsia killings happened. If you've ever seen the Owen Wilson and Gene Hackman movie, Behind Enemy Lines, mm. to a degree, it's a, it's a fictionalization of elements of what actually happened in Severnitsia, which is that um, US uh, planes were capturing not only the killing, but the movement of physical remains um, be, that happened in a building into multiple separate individual graves. And so the, um, that SR-71 Blackbird example is really interesting to look at as we look at the history of documenting war crimes, that it's it's not actually um, an aberration. Going back to the Holocaust, the, some of the first intelligence that was put on uh, FDR's desk of the gas chambers um, came from uh, what was called photogrammetry, which is um, technical analysis of images taken, in this case, by the US Army Air Corps and allies of trains that were going to factories that didn't seem to produce anything. Um, well, what they were seeing, and the only example they could come up with probabilistically, or the only explanation they could come up with is that whatever was being moved into those um, facilities was being burned. And what uh, was being moved in those facilities were Jews, uh, uh, Roma people, and others who were being killed in the Holocaust. And so the history of uh, the use of reconnaissance um, through multiple means, reconnaissance photography in war crimes um, on aerial platforms um, really goes back to the dawn of uh, photographic reconnaissance in general. And so let's fast forward to now and what's happening in Ukraine, thinking about those sort of three ways in which uh, information would come out of war zones, you know, only 12 to 15 years ago. Now we are at a moment 
um, that I call in my research, the, the dawn of the social digital terrain. Meaning uh, we, we talk a lot about cyberspace and cyber war, which frankly I think is already anachronistic and is not particularly helpful. Um, we are past cyber war. <laughs> cyber war is just one element of a new type of, of warfare or an enhanced type of warfare that I call basically social informatic. And so this social digital terrain, if you think about it, is a triangle. And it's really the fusion of physical infrastructure, social networks, and social systems, and informatics, which we'll define informatics here as information about information. And so the phenomena of this social digital terrain that we see creating a new battle space and also a new space or terrain of legibility for evidence collection, it did not begin with Ukraine um, by any means. Um, it, we see this um, as early as 2007 with uh, the violence after Kenya's election and the deployment of a platform called Ushahidi, which in Swahili means witness um, or, or to observe. And that was the first sort of crisis mapping operation to take cell phone messages and to put them on, on a crisis map. And in the past 15 years, really since that election violence at the end of 2007, beginning of 2008, we've had conflicts like Syria, um, most notably, um, really be defined by the increasingly growing corpus of information that's being di digitally transmitted through uh, social media, through text messages, through encrypted messaging apps, WhatsApp, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, and Telegram, um, means that we went from having a drought of information to now having a deluge, where in the past our problem was obtaining information about what was happening on the ground, and now the problem is absorbing the sheer amount of um, digital data that's coming and often coming in a way that is being weaponized by nation states and non-state actors. Uh, a really early and important example of this is ISIS. Um, unlike many perpetrators of mass atrocities and war crimes, um, and I apologize for the Rhodesian Ridgeback in the background who is asking for food. Um, the uh, ISIS was unique in the sense that um, they used this social digital terrain to publicize their killing as part of recruitment in a, a type of killing that I call totemic, meaning that they would present the bodies and present the killing act um, through digital means as basically their marketing strategy for new members and for um, their message. And so in other cases, we see the, this social digital terrain being weaponized to actually facilitate the killing act. In the case, and AI plays a role in this, and machine learning plays a role in this. In the case of the Rohingya in 2017, it's arguably the first genocide that, um, and, and I don't use that word, lightly, um, and I don't say alleged, the United Nations has concluded it was an act of genocide through the Independent Commission of Experts that utilized Facebook Messenger to uh, incite violence against Rohingya communities, um, not as like ISIS publicizing the act for marketing purposes, but as a way to actually cause the killing act um, that killed uh, at least a quarter of a million Rohingya and displaced an additional 750,000 people into, from Myanmar into Bangladesh, where they are to this day as refugees. And so in a very short period of time, we've seen um, examples of this social digital terrain, which includes social media, it includes phone data, data from phones and metadata, mobility data called, called detail records. Um, it's seen satellite, commercial satellite imagery. 
um, which previously historically was only available to governments in the Clinton administration, that process of allowing commercial satellite imagery began. And so by the early 2000s, we have imagery available. Um, one of the first examples of this in the human rights context was Amnesty and the Eyes on Darfur campaign. And then the first at scale use of fusing this um, social media and, and digitally produced data from the ground with imagery, um, I led for George Clooney at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, which was called Satellite Sentinel Project in 2011 to 2012, which was the first large scale deployment of what's called um, persistent tasking. So we were sending um, satellites over locations um, in a sometimes 24 to 12 hour cadence. And we collected, uh, if you sold it on the open market, over $16 million worth of very high resolution satellite imagery. Um, and so it, we collect in that 18 month period, more imagery in 2011, 2012, than had ever been collected and used by civil society in human history. Um, and we mapped more of Sudan and South Sudan in those 18 months than had ever been mapped by satellite commercially in, at that point, over almost um, 12 years of commercial satellite collection. And so in a very short period of time, the headline here is we've gone from this being theoretical to this being a common part of practice for non-governmental organizations, um, international tribunals and courts such as the ICC and governments and corporations um, and machine learning um, systems are now increasingly central to not only how this data is collected, but how this data is processed and how this data is stored for purposes of what's called COC or chain of custody, which is uh, how the data is, the individual streams of data, or what we're talking about here is a mosaic, what's called the mosaic effect, which is combinations of multiple streams of data are brought together and retained and preserved, like in an analog space where you would collect a, uh, a, a bullet shell uh, casing or a slug at a crime scene, um, and you put it in a plastic bag to take it to the lab. Now we're collecting through the available um, options to make these social digital terrains of conflict legible. We are collecting terabytes of data where just 10 years ago it was gigabytes. It was <laughs> now we're going to terabytes and we'll be going to petabytes. And so the, the, the headline here, before I start showing you some examples of what we're actually doing and shut up a little bit, that um, five years ago, people would say that digital collection of alleged evidence of, of crimes um, was a support for traditional war crimes investigation. Now I'll say it's actually more commonly used and more important in court than um, a lot of what happens on the ground, that there's been this seismic shift of evidence collection being supported by digital methods to now analog methods supporting the quality of digital evidence. And one note here is that, um, and I can tell you a specific story from uh, Sudan, is that um, these tools that you're gonna see in a second, um, they, they do not replace witness testimony. In fact, they actually make witness testimony stronger. Uh, and a quick example, in two, the summer of 2011, Sudan Armed Forces in a militia group that you know as the John Jaweed, but is also referred to as Abu Tira, or the Central Reserve Police of the Bashir government in Sudan, um, killed um, an estimated several thousand Nuba uh, ethnic people in the Nuba Mountains uh, of Sudan in a city called Kadugli. 
and we were in overwatch while this massacre was occurring. And we knew that there was probably a mass grave um, that was at least the size of a soccer or what for our European colleagues, a football pitch um, to the south of what was called the Tilo School. And we needed to find which building was the school to begin to set up our tasking with a satellite called QuickBird um, to try and, and get a picture of this alleged mass grave. And this was the first time that commercial satellite imagery was used by civilian analysts by us, but it was the first time anyone had done it, to catch a mass grave that was in progress. Uh, a couple of years before that, we had caught a mass grave I had been investigating for some time in Afghanistan that had been dug out of the ground. But this was the first time we were catching one being built. And so we had contact with a witness on the ground in using um, uh, Microsoft Paint. Um, we <laughs> sent him, uh, and you have to understand this individual, who I am limited in what I can describe about him. When people were fleeing the city, the night the killing started, his wife went into labor with their child um, and, and had a breech birth. And they were in basically like a root cellar or a basement um, in a building near a church where he was uh, a deacon. And uh, so mama survived and the baby survived, but they couldn't move. And uh, so we were able to get in contact with him and we began to create a method called GRID or ground reporting through imagery delivery, where we sent him a satellite image before the killing started and it had alphanumeric grids on it. And he had to this, his code name, I didn't come up with the code name, I really hate his code name, but it's Job. Um, anyhow, source Job had to identify on this alphanumeric grid where he had seen the grave and where the school was. And what we were able to do here is to really improve the veracity of his testimony by showing him an image before the killing. And so we did not leave the witness. And as he began to identify critical locations related to the killing um, on the map, he was basically um, uh, creating a stronger corroboration method temporally and spatially for strengthening his witness testimony. Um, we then realized that our aperture on the shop was very small, it was like 10 kilometers. And so we couldn't miss, and he volunteered of his own free will to walk from the school down to a radio tower near the site and walk toe by heel so that we could measure precisely um, where the um, satellite would go to take the shot. And so literally this man who was watching his friends, family, neighbors being killed around him, who's hiding with his wife and newborn child in a basement, um, was responsible for tasking a multi-million dollar US spy satellite to break out of orbit <laughs> and to go <laughs> rocketing 450 miles above the Earth's surface to hit this shot. And we hit it. Um, my colleagues and I were up at 2.33 AM when it went over Sudan, and we got the signal back from the ground station in Colorado that the shot got hit, and we were literally out on our porch in the middle of the night running around like we just ran won the World Cup. What we saw when the image came down is, in fact, it wasn't one grave, it was three. And that, um, at that point, the U.S. government was denying that the um, killing was happening um, at a level which was genocidal. Um, and they denied that mass graves were happening on the ground because the Obama administration did not want to say the G word, genocide. Once we got that shot, um, the US government changed its tune. Um, and so satellites can't um, create political will, um, but they can activate it and they can also change political facts um, on the ground in a world capitalist. Um, I could go on and on, but let me actually show you some imagery and some uh, imagery and open source analysis 
from Ukraine. And Darius, if I'm going over, tell me to shut up. Um, I think I think we're still uh, good to see some imagery. So okay, so a um, in uh, let's see here in September we released a report that we did with Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and so this is the way in which we've heard a lot of uh, of really important things today about how machine learning can um, uh, do negative things in society. Well, here's a more positive um, application of machine learning. Um, let me zoom in here. And um, so this is um, just some context. Russia, since the start of the war, has been bombarding crop storage facilities in Ukraine, silos um, and uh, warehouses in what's called grain elevators. And so, we um, got a, um, and we'll go into this in a second here. Um, we got um, a data set that was originally collected by the Ukrainians, uh, transmitted to us through the US Department of Agriculture, which we used to create a base map of where we think all of the certified, Ukrainian certified grain storage facilities are. But we realized there was a lot that were built after that 2019 data set was created. And so working with Oak Ridge, we, um, and the, I'll, I'll zoom in better here. Um, working with Oak Ridge National Lab and the Department of Energy, we created a, um, a machine learning algorithm, an object detection algorithm that helped us search um, satellite imagery collected by the US government of, all of Ukraine to identify any potential crop storage facility that wasn't in that list. And so here is um, a facility that we were able to identify um, and this, um, this is a slider. So this is the facility before the alleged attack. Um, and then this is the facility after the alleged attack. <laughs> and so it's actually during the alleged attack. So this is a set of grain elevators that are on fire and burning. Um, the roofs have collapsed. And um, so if you look at this image, does anyone notice something a little weird about it in terms of the angle? So I'm gonna show you a really cool trick we do here. Does anyone know how it looks a little bent? Okay, what we've done is called an off nadir angle shot. To see the sides of buildings, we move the lens slightly. So we're, we're shooting at what's called, um, here you can see it's a 37 degree um, off nadir angle. And we have that in the metadata. Um, why I bring this out is that when we're building machine learning models and object detection models for satellite imagery, we have to account for multiple factors in terms of the training data that is different than, say, looking like uh, our colleagues at DeepMind do at um, photographs, uh, at, at digital images online. We have to account for things like nadir angle. Um, we have to account for things like image quality, coloration type. And so with Oak Ridge, we were able to account for all of those factors. Um, let me show you some, some more um, structural damage, and then I'll show you a couple other examples from Ukraine um, that are not prop storage facilities. Um, uh, Nathan, would you be able to do this in like two minutes? More yes, or less? I'll go very quick. So. Here's a port facility with many uh, grain silos, and here's after it's been hit. And so what we can do through machine learning is we can detect change um, by comparing images with a computer um, at high speed. And what this means from an evidentiary perspective is we can use this, especially with things like Planet Lab data, where they're collecting daily images at lower resolution through microsatellites, we can begin to get a sense of precisely when that 
damage may have allegedly happened. And that provides, frankly, a more accurate evidentiary view than just witness testimony alone. Let me show you one quick example that's not grain, and then I will go to questions. There's a lot to talk about here, and thank you for your patience. One of the big problems with um, satellite imagery and open source is that it's slow to load. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, let me just pull up another report. Um, what we can also do in what we've been most known for um, in the um, conflict observatory is we've identified um, the filtration system by which Russia has um, taken um, civilians and put them into basically a gulag system. And we've identified those camps and other facilities. We've also, our colleagues at Planscape AI, you can see here, um, have used call detail records to track through machine learning um, civilian displacement in real time by tracking changes in cell phone data. Um, so here I'll just show you very quickly in um, this image here, um, which shows our method in terms of um, fusing together uh, very briefly open source information in the data around that, which we use some AI to do, um, but also manual analysis with imagery. So this is a site where civilians were being forced to register in the town of Bezamene, and we can see cars, we can see the tents where they are being uh, kept during their filtration period, uh, basically um, deter determine whether they're a threat to Russia and whether they'll be taken to basically a concentration camp or released. And we were able to take ground photos and the metadata within them and compare that to visual objects in latitude and longitude. And so we were able to get very close in dates between the ground photos and satellite imagery and really corroborate what was happening at this facility in a precise way. Um, I can go on and on, but I'll take your questions now and then um, we can close. Over. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, uh, that was really an, uh, well illustrative of also how um, well, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us to, um, yeah, to to really deal with these um, these atrocities uh, out there and and support uh, human rights in the end. Um, so, are there any uh, questions uh, for 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 Nathan? Um, Barves, please. Uh, oh, you, or maybe I would just like yeah, quickly go through the question from Thomas in the chat. Um, could such images be forged, manipulated, or plausibly be accused of being so forged? We currently have a working group um, across different agencies and institutions looking at this very uh, question, Thomas. Um, so I'll give you two quick answers. One, it's actually really hard um, because with, with satellites, they take very specific metadata and often they're not the only satellite taking that, um, an image of that location. And the metadata is extremely precise. And so um, efforts in the past, um, early in the war, Russia claimed that certain images were falsified and they attempted to show that. Um, and through uh, bots on Twitter, they presented tweets saying that a image, I believe it was the Mariupol theater, that the metadata was off. But you could see in the screenshots they had taken that they had disabled certain settings on their imagery analysis platform. <laughs> and then people responded with screenshots of those same settings turned back on and the metadata was correct. And so that was a notable moment where Russia tried to say the image was falsified. And in the way they said it was falsified, they proved the way in which it was accurate. So that, that's thing one. The second piece is that often how, and we saw this with Myanmar, where they used helicopters in the case of trying to refute imagery of burned villages, that they attempted 
to take other images from a helicopter platform. And they used an off nader angle to hide the burned village. But in the distance, we saw another burned village we didn't know about <laughs> in the, the, and the moment that they were trying to discount the burned village. We're like, okay, well, let's say that that is wrong. What about that thing on fire over there? And so um, there will probably come a time where we have a better example of tradecraft by a perpetrator. Um, but I'll give you the best one. When we were watching Holmes um, in Syria at the start of the Syrian civil war, we could see um, tanks and artillery moving into position to attack. And we were 24 hours from the anniversary of the Hama massacre um, carried out by Bashir's uh, father, and uh, sorry, Assad's father. I got my dictators mixed up there. And we we sent out a warning to colleagues in the government's institutions that we thought they were gonna fire because we could see their artillery was ready to go. And they were at an angle with their guns where we thought they were gonna fire into apartment buildings, which they did. And right as they were about to open fire, they blew up an oil pipeline in Hama, which sent particulate smoke into the air that shut off the algorithms on what's called our, our cloud masking algorithm, which made the satellite not take a picture so it could preserve space. It's thought the smoke was cloud. And so we had shots the day after of apartment buildings on fire, but the actual moment of the uh, attack point by the artillery was obscured because they manipulated the ALK. Over. Thanks, thanks, Nate. And so let's just uh, maybe briefly, there's a last question on Afghanistan in the chat. Um, we'll be grateful if you could maybe answer that in one or two minutes, if that's possible. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I uh, have worked on Afghanistan for much of my career, including um, uh, being in Afghanistan with Oxfam and serving in support of the UN Office with the High Commission for Human Rights and UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan. And a lot of the tactics I've developed on satellite imagery really began, I mentioned this earlier, in reference to the Dashi Lely grave that I was working on um, and was the basis of some of the initial ICC investigations, which caused the United States to initiate the American Service Members Protection Act um, to prevent U US uh, service members from being tried by the ICC. Um, so um, yes is the, <laughs> is the answer. Um, and, uh, uh, and to be precise, data that I have collected has been shared by others with the ICC um, it has been relevant to ICC investigations in Afghanistan or elsewhere. And I've also served as a, a consultant to the ICC on a specific case and also helped train um, uh, investigative division members in the office of the prosecutor. Um, so, yes. Thanks a lot. And thanks again, Nathan, for, for joining us and for, uh, for your insights here at the Yale Global Justice Program. Thank you.